My name is Rick Tyrell. I'm a professor in the psychology department at Clemson, and I run the visual perception and performance lab. When I was a grad student, I was in an experimental psychology program, fairly basic science program. But I, I went to uh, Penn State University to work with a big shot there who um, was kind of early leader in taking seriously both basic science and applied science and trying to meld those two together uh, to simultaneously do research that helps our understanding in a basic science perspective, but also helps address societal problems in the, an applied science perspective. So that's always been built into me from the start. And I've always uh, kind of used that as uh, my guiding principle. Uh, when figuring out how to how to do research and what to study. Uh, so partway through grad school, I happened across a job ad um, from Clemson University, and they were looking for somebody to work in the human factors program. At that point, it was just a terminal master's program. So there are three things about that ad that caught my eye. First was they had a human factors graduate program. Uh, there's relatively few of those, and I was excited to be part of one. But then it also said, uh, something about in the ad, it said something about lakes and mountains nearby, and both of those excited me as well. So human factors, lakes and mountains, I sent my CV in right away uh, and was lucky enough to, to get the gig. So I've been here ever since then. I've been at Clemson for about uh, 26 years now, so I'm officially old. Uh, and I've never been tempted to leave because it's it's this is my dream job, and I'm really happy to, to be here. Uh, I study uh, human vision, uh, but I take a very applied perspective on that. So I look for scenarios where uh, people's ability to see well is what limits their performance, what limits their safety, which limits their ability to get the job done. Uh, so whenever there's an applied aspect to human vision, I tend to get very excited. Uh, the, the part of that that I've been concentrating on most recently is how well drivers see things at night. So I've been studying a lot of issues pertaining to night vision and how well drivers see things that, that might unexpectedly appear on the roadway at nighttime. Well, I was inherently interested in, in human vision uh, since I was an undergrad. Uh, and then I spent two years uh, working uh, in a lab before I decided to go to grad school. And those two years further cemented my interest in how well people see and the neural mechanisms that support our ability to see. But at the same time, I became very interested in the societal problems associated with people not being able to see well. Uh, and so um, I, I've been interested in, in those things for an awful long time. And my experience in grad school uh, just kind of further emphasized that not only am I really interested in this stuff, but there are big time problems that need to be addressed. Uh, my lab on campus is kind of peculiar. It's in the first floor bracket hall. Um, it's peculiar because all the walls are painted black, all the cabinets are painted black. And it's a fairly narrow um, space. It's, it's what we call in the business a visual alley. So you can um, put things on the wall 20 feet away and see how well um, people see things that are far away. Uh, and we have very, very tight control over the lighting. Uh, so it's the ideal kind of lab space to conduct the kind of research that we do uh, indoors. But then a lot of our research happens outdoors as well. When we wanna see how well drivers see things at night, um, often that ends up um, pushing us outdoors. So we collect data outside, uh, even either daytime or night, depending on the situation. So we'll, uh, for example, put people in vehicles and uh, we might park them on a utility road that we use that's right next to the lake. And we can do careful psychophysical testing where we put stimuli out in front of them in front of a stationary car and uh, see how well uh, people see them. Or we'll go on road and we'll put, uh, for example, we'll plant pedestrians or bicyclists uh, adjacent to the roadway and an open roadway in the Clemson area and see how well people respond uh, to seeing them. And we can vary things like headlighting conditions. We can vary uh, the clothing or the reflectivity conditions that a bicyclist or a pedestrian might wear. Um, I typically don't want um, a large group of grad students in my lab. I like, um, I think it's very important to have one-on-one -on -one time between me and my grad students. So um, I try to limit the number of grad students in my lab to two to three at a time to make it possible to have all the one-on-one uh, -on -one contact that is necessary. Uh, so I, I like to keep a small lab, uh, 
and a productive lab. I work hard to give a separate kind of advising experience to every one of my grad students. Um, it all depends on the chemistry between uh, myself and the grad student. So um, I make sure I have enough time to give them what they need. And I wanna make sure that they are very comfortable in communicating with me. I think the, the bedrock of a relationship between a grad student and an advisor is thorough, uh, open communication. Uh, not just about the problems of the day and how to get around them, but also from a big picture perspective, you know, where do the students want to go? And I want to figure out how best to get them in the direction that they want to go when they leave Clemson. Embarking on, on grad school is a big deal, and it doesn't work often if a grad student is less than enthusiastic about what they're about to do. So I wanna see students who know that they're doing the thing that they wanna be doing. I wanna see students who are excited to be doing it. And I wanna see students who realize that what they're doing is important, both for themselves and their future career, but also for society at large as well. I wanna see uh, people who are excited to do the science, people who are excited to address societal problems that need our help. I expect grad students to be involved in research from day one. Um, I think um, that's critical. I think primarily grad students need to see their role as um, researchers. And sure, they take a lot of classes and they might have assistantship duties, but in the end, um, where the rewards are in grad school are uh, all based on research productivity. So the more and the better research they get done, the bigger the rewards are. Uh, that's true while they're in grad school, and it's certainly true after they're done with grad school as well. You know, a central theme to what I see as uh, being a successful grad student um, is that grad students need to be able to not see obstacles and roadblocks, but instead see hurdles that need to be cleared. Um, a creative and motivated grad student can find solutions to whatever problems might pop up. So um, rather than being defeated because the path is less than clear and open, um, a strong grad student is more likely to see a way around or way over or way through whatever the challenge is uh, to get to where they need to go. So um, not taking no for an answer and finding creative solutions is a really powerful skill. My former grad students have been very successful when they left Clemson. They, um, have gone on a bunch of different paths. You know, some of them are working in the you know, big tech industry, Amazon and Microsoft and places like that. Others have gone into um, like government research. Uh, so some of them are doing um, high powered research and uh, for the federal government and the transportation uh, sector. Um, and I've been um, really happy to see those students uh, continuing their research success after they leave. Uh, and they've been very happy, which is great. Um, but then there are other students who have uh, gone in, in a different direction to look at forensic consulting. Uh, so they work for consulting agencies that work with attorneys uh, and the attorneys are trying to litigate um, typically traffic crashes and they're trying to um, get the right expert to be able to inform uh, judges, juries and attorneys about um, what are the key scientific principles that need to be understood uh, to make sound solid decisions. So they've been very happy and very successful as well. I'm really proud of my past grad students. I think the experiences that my grad students get in grad school kind of set the stage for success uh, in whatever direction they decide uh, to, to go. Uh, I think um, because they have developed habits of finding solutions to problems, to not giving in to obstacles that might pop up, um, to be able to blend science with application so well um, that it sets the stage for success, regardless of what direction they go in. Um, having a solid foundation in science is a great thing to have. Uh, the ability to um, design the right kind of study for the right kind of question is more important than anybody can imagine. Um, but also the ability to have fun while they're doing it. You know, you've got to, you know, you invest so much of yourself in your career, you might as well have a career that you enjoy. And so my students have, have been able to do that really well as well. Yeah, it's, it's funny how that process often takes care of itself. Like um, 
my most recent grad students have had job offers before they ever entered the job market. So they were not um, looking for work and yet they were receiving these job offers. Uh, so that's a good position to be in. But also um, in terms of internships, a great uh, thing is the Clemson family is out there. The, uh, the network of Clemson alumni is big and getting bigger all the time. And uh, former alumni love to help out current students. And that has been a really useful networking skill as well. Go Tigers. <laughs>